Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another COVID debunking video. So a few months ago, a paper was published in Nature, which is a great journal, and this is a great paper. But anti-vaxxers seem to be confusing it and misrepresenting it for reasons that support their own agenda and not actually telling you the details about it. So let's explain it. So the name of this paper is called N1 methyl pseudouridylation of mRNA causes plus one ribosomal frame shifting. I got you. I'm here to walk you through it and explain what this paper means and what it means in the context of the mRNA vaccine literature. So let me give you some quick background here. mRNA is the messenger of gene expression. Our genes are stored in the form of DNA, which is a double helix molecule that the cells house in our nuclei. In order to get information out of the DNA, the cell needs to convert or transcribe the message stored in the DNA into the form of mRNA. Once the DNA is transcribed into RNA, it's transported outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where structures called ribosomes will bind to and read the mRNA. When they read the mRNA, they can translate that genetic code into a protein. And the protein is the thing that actually does the work. The genes don't do the work, the proteins do. Think of the DNA as the recipe that's in a cookbook that's kept in a library. And then you go into that library and write down your own version of that recipe on a piece of paper. That piece of paper is the mRNA. And then you are the ribosome reading that recipe and translating it into a physical dish. And then the physical dish is the protein. That's the way gene expression works. This information comes in the form of bases. In DNA, these bases are described as four letters, A, T, C, and G. In mRNA, these letters are a little bit different. They're A, U, C, and G. This swapping of the letter T for the letter U is one of the hallmarks that distinguishes DNA from RNA. But these letters can be further modified into kind of special cases. And in this case, N1-methyl-pseudouridine is a special modification of the letter U in RNA. This modification is found naturally in a lot of our own RNA. In fact, it's part of what helps our innate immune system distinguish the difference between our own RNA molecules and the RNA molecules that come from, say, viruses. So in order to help mRNA vaccines actually do their job, and not be recognized as foreign viral RNA and just eliminated immediately before they can code into protein, mRNA vaccines are modified with N1-methylpseudouridine. So the question is, does modifying every letter U in the mRNA vaccine technology to N1-methylpseudouridine affect the way the ribosome reads the transcript and makes a protein? This question was asked pretty early on in the development of mRNA vaccine technology, and there are some pretty good papers demonstrating that it doesn't significantly affect the way that the ribosome reads the mRNA. For example, there's this paper published in Cell Reports in 2022 titled n one methyl pseudouridine found in COVID mRNA vaccines produces faithful protein products. In it, they measured the protein products produced by a regular mRNA molecule and an mRNA molecule that has all N1-methylpseudouridine substitutions. And they found that both create practically the same product, leading them to conclude that N1-methylpseudouridine mRNA produces faithful protein products. So, sorry, a little bit more background. When a ribosome reads an mRNA, it does it in a specific way. It reads it three letters at a time. Each three letters corresponds to one amino acid, and a chain of specific amino acids is what makes up a particular protein. If the three letters that the ribosome reads gets shifted by one, then that's called a frame shift. If the three letters that the ribosome is reading is mismatched, then it'll substitute an incorrect amino acid for a particular three-letter sequence. So this paper did check for both phenomenon. 
They checked whether or not the substitution of uridine for M1 methylcytouridine affects the mismatching abilities of the ribosome. In other words, it tested whether or not the ribosome is more likely to mismatch three-letter segments to the wrong amino acid, and they found that it's not more likely to do that. They also did an experiment where once the ribosome translates these mRNA molecules into protein, they tried to detect the product with an antibody. And this antibody detected a tag that the researchers put at one particular end of the protein. And in their results, they found that the levels of protein did not significantly differ between the unmodified and modified mRNA experiments. But then comes this Nature paper, which shows that this n one methylcytouridylated mRNA does actually have a propensity to cause a plus one frame shifting of the ribosome reading process. Again, to reiterate, the ribosome reads in three letter segments. So if you take the ribosome and shift it plus one, then that changes the entire three letter frame that it's reading in for the rest of its read. And they actually show this in pretty exquisite detail. It's one of those papers that's just Ah, you're reading it and you're asking, but wait, what about this experiment? Did they do that? And then that's the next experiment they describe. It's very good, and it does show that N1 methylcytouridylation does have an increased chance of this plus one frame shift. The reason that they were able to find it and the previous papers were not is because they used an N terminal tag rather than the C terminal tag that was used in the previous paper. What does this mean? Well, proteins have specific ends. They have a front end, which is called the N terminus, and they have a back end, which is called a C terminus. When a ribosome reads an mRNA and starts creating a protein, it starts creating it at the N terminus. And then as it reads, the last segment that it creates is the C terminus. So by using an N terminal tag, the authors of this more recent paper were able to detect the frame shift proteins. And the reason that the previous papers could not detect the frame shift proteins was because they were using a C terminal tag. And if the ribosome shifts frames, then it's going to not encode that C terminal tag correctly. So again, the first paper was really good at showing that there is no significant difference between a regular uridine base and an N1 methyl pseudouridine base. But this more recent paper used a method that is going to allow them to detect more sensitively what proteins are produced. And it's this result that anti-vaxxers are harping on and misrepresenting. Because the ribosomes that are reading the N1 methyl pseudouridylated mRNA are at some tiny fraction of the time producing different proteins due to a frame shift, then anti-vaxxers are saying that that's bad and that that's going to lead to all sorts of nebulous diseases. But in this paper, the authors go on to explain that these plus one frame shift of proteins were not associated with any increased risk of adverse events. And that's because these plus one frame shifted proteins represent such a minority of the proteins produced from the mRNA that it doesn't have a significant effect. This can be further experimentally demonstrated by looking at this image here, which is an unbiased measurement of the protein products produced by the vaccine mRNA. This method doesn't use antibodies or tags to visualize the proteins, it just uses an unbiased stain. And in it you can see that the major protein product is the spike protein and you can't see any other protein products. That's because there are just too few of them to visualize, even with a very sensitive method like this. And because these frame-shifted protein products are present in such small quantities, our cells' natural abilities to deal with misfolded proteins can pretty easily deal with them. In fact, most unfolded proteins never even leave the endoplasmic reticulum. Anti-vaxxers will try to scare you by saying that frame-shifting can cause all sorts of diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases, but the huge difference there, and the major thing that they're not understanding, is the fact that these frameshift mutations happen at the level of DNA. In this case, you have a mutation in your DNA, which means that you're permanently producing a frameshifted protein. This is extremely different from what we're seeing with these mRNA vaccines, where ribosomes are extremely rarely slipping on the mRNA and creating alternative products. The intended product is there in very, very high abundance, 
no different from unmodified mRNA, and these frame-shifted protein products are extremely, extremely low in number. This is again further driven home by this study, which collected spike protein products from vaccine-modified mRNA and obtained a cryo-EM structure. Obtaining a cryo-EM structure of this high resolution requires a protein product to be in high abundance and properly folded. So again, anti-vaxxers are either not understanding very basic concepts in molecular and cellular biology, or they're lying to you. And they're definitely misrepresenting this paper. This is best summarized by the authors themselves when they say that overall, these data increase our understanding of how modified ribonucleotides affect the fidelity of mRNA translation. And although there are no adverse outcomes reported from mistranslation of mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in humans, these data highlight potential off-target effects for future mRNA-based therapeutics and demonstrate the requirement for sequence optimization. So in other words, they found that this phenomenon they observed presents no issues with SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines. There's no evidence for that. But in the paper, they do steps to optimize the sequence and thereby eliminate this plus one frame shift phenomenon, which means that future mRNA-based technologies can optimize their sequence and eliminate this problem. So not only are these authors identifying a basic molecular concept that we didn't previously know about with mRNA vaccine technology, they are making it better. And that's the real take-home from this paper. It's that this issue is not apparently a problem with SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines, but it's something we can look out for in future mRNA technology to make sure that it doesn't happen. And it indeed is not an issue with COVID mRNA vaccines. There is absolutely no epidemiological data that anti-vaxxers can point to to associate this molecular mechanism with a real-world problem. Please, anti-vaxxers, don't mistake scientific progress for something that supports your own deluded agenda. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. I do hope you enjoyed it. It was a little more mechanistic than usual, but all of the science that I talk about in this video are going to be linked in the description below so that you can read them for yourself. And of course, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed it. And of course, if you like this video, then don't forget to like it and subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. Thank you.